that doesn't get you excited, then maybe you need to find something else to do. Well, one day is Thursday, September 14, 2023. This is the Week Kid Charts. I just want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. By the way, if you want to join these shows live, go to DaveLearner.com slash webinar, register for one, and you're registered for all. I might, uh, I might do a YouTube live at some point. I have to look into that. Uh, anyway, uh, what are we talking about? Well, current market conditions, obviously, your questions on trading, your favorite stock, and crypto picks. And this was kind of a last-minute last thing, but I think it dovetails nicely into what we would talk about. And it's figure these three things out, and you'll own the world. That'll make a lot of sense in a few minutes. And then I got a question at the last minute, which sort of also kind of dovetailed in everything, and that's why I put that last little segment in on figure these things three things out is how did know how did I know that conditions would be choppy and how will you know when they improve? So we'll get to that in just one second. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen as you know you can lose money trading or as I like to sum it up, all predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That comes from Greg Morris. My brother from another brother. Okay, so I got this question in last minute and he said that uh Feel free to cover it next week or whenever, but I thought it would work nicely tonight. You've been spot on regarding the current stock market chop fest. Thank you. No one has ever thanked me in my career <laughs> for pointing out that the market is choppy and remains choppy and that we shouldn't do anything. So, Asib, thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm humbled by that. So, thank you. Would you kindly help us understand your method? How did you arrive at such insights? For instance, was just the bottom-up analysis and not finding any setups? Do you also take into account price action of the big indices, such as the P's and the NDX? How can we tell when we are out of the current malaise? Is it just breaking out above the July highs, or is there a possibility to get in early with a pullback? Okay, so let's break that down. Was it just bottom-up analysis and not finding any setups? Well, that's where my analysis starts. Now, I do at the end of the night when I'm done with all my scans, and I run loose parameter scans, which just look for recent 20-day highs or lows, which means a pullback, in other words. And that scan usually produces about 1,500 stocks. Lately, it's been a little bit less. And I go through most of those sort of by historical volatility. I look at where the setups are stacking up or if there's any and if there's setups is if there's a lot of overhead supply and, and anything that looks vaguely interesting or remotely interesting, I copy over to another list. And in that process, I'm able to determine if the market is healthy or not. And I've told the story a thousand times. And I guess I'll tell it one more. <laughs> Back when the market was still making new highs in 2000, and seven, if you watch a lot of older presentations, I refer to it as a 2007 bear market when it really didn't start till 2008. But in late 2007, I couldn't find any long side setups to save my life. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen as far as listening to the database. And I reached a point where I kept apologizing to my clients as I kept recommending more and more shorts. And when the market tanked in earnest, all those shorts really paid off well. And that's just a, a, a matter of listening to the database. And as I often say each week, quoting Jimmy Rogers, I think it's Jimmy Rogers, you got to be careful about, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's Ed Sakota. And Ed Sakota once said that you, you can't confuse intuition with into wishing. And uh, just without getting sidetracked too much, I was looking at some older writings that I did this morning, looking for some stuff that I'll show you in a few minutes. And I came across one where it talked about when you're you're in a state of flow and you're trading and everything is working fantastic and it's almost like having an out of body experience and you're making tons of money and everything just seems so simple that it all works just swimmingly and when that happens it's the most beautiful thing it's what we live for and i'll talk a lot more about that in upcoming presentations getting to that that state of flow so to speak but anyway the problem is once once you feel it a few times, you kind of get addicted to it. And, and that's where the intuition comes in 
you're trying to make that happen and and that's where you get into a lot of trouble and i'm probably as guilty as anyone anyway just continuing on it, it, in other words if, i guess getting back to the database if the database isn't producing a whole lot of setups don't try to make something happen that's not there as i often say you really should have an f yeah feeling about it it's kind of interesting i, I found some old notes earlier today and the f yeah thing came from one of the Tim Ferriss books. I didn't even realize that. It basically said if somebody asks you to do something or offers you some sort of opportunity, if you're not feeling that, yeah, then don't take it. Well, that certainly applies to trading. I didn't realize that's where that came from. But anyway, to give Mr. Ferriss some credit. Now, Asim was asking, do you take into account price action of the big indices such as S&P and NDX? And of course I do. So let's take a look at that now. Oh, by the way, getting back to the database thing, one other thing I want to add to that is in upcoming presentations, I'll, I'll, I'll be cognizant from now on and see what I could show you from the database and what it's producing. Now, what I would recommend you do is go in and look at the service archives. You can go to daveline.com slash archives and kind of get into my mindset and go back earlier this summer when the market was trending to see what I was showing for setups and see what I was saying about the market. And then notice how the market slowly kind of changed and began to chop around and how all of a sudden my tune began to change. And of course, your own equity performance will help you out a lot there too. Remember, I said in, in a few presentations on May 3rd, I got an email and I think I answered it on the 4th and said to a client who was thinking about trying someone else, I said, well, if this new guy is a trend follower, he's gonna look like a genius because we went through all this chop and we were due to catch a trend. And then lo and behold, we caught the mother of all trends. Unfortunately, that just sort of came to an end. So a lot of it is gonna be your own performance. If you start getting stopped out of setups, that could be kind of a shot across the bow. And back to 2007, if memory serves, we started getting stopped out of longs, couldn't find a new long side setup to save our lives. And then there was nothing but a plethora of shorts showing up. And it was so weird, they showed up months before the market actually crashed. We had sort of a, a rolling crash, so to speak, as one area after another began to roll over. Now, by looking at the database, looking at those internals, internals meaning individual stocks, you began to see what's really happening under the surface because sometimes maybe a few big stocks like an apple or a meta or whatever might be masking what's really happening underneath the surface and that's why this bottom-up analysis is so important as this gentleman pointed out so let's take a look at at the the indices and this original presentation when i woke up this morning was more of what are the illustrators illustrating. Now, if you know me, you know I'm not a big fan of indicators, but I do have some indicators, so to speak. And I like to refer to them as illustrators because they're price-based, as all indicators are, right? I guess you could have a volume-based indicator, but let's just focus on price because that's what we do as technicians. They're price-based, but they're a derivative of price. They're a second derivative. First derivative would be price. Second derivative would be the indicator. And I kind of mix them together a little bit to where my indicator is showing me what's actually happening in the price. For instance, the Landry light just shows me on the upside when the lows are greater than the moving average. So the first day that happens, this becomes a green bar. And then this simply counts each day that the market stays above that moving average until it intersects it, then it goes to zero. And then when it, drops below it it goes to red so it's good as a general statement as long as you're above pick your favorite moving average but in, in my case i've really kind of fallen in love with the 30 ema i know you want to party with me you know we could we'll get together one day and drink some beers and we'll talk about emas but anyway it's good when the lows are greater than the moving average and the longer the better when that occurs now you could see when we got into this malaise, so to speak, the market began to break down a little bit, began to look a little ugly. We had some downside Landry light, which is bad, and that's the highs are less than the moving average. And then now we have green and red, and we're back to green again. There was a little green and red in between too, down here. So this is obviously a market 
that has become choppy. So that's one little illustrator you could use, the Landry light. And uh, Landry light's pretty simple uh, formula. I think it's, uh, I know a couple of you guys have programmed it for TradingView. It, it actually comes with the stock meta stock uh, program. It's in ACP, which is stock charts program, which I really love. And there's a free plugin on that. In fact, the plugin is down here. Like this video and you'll have access to the plugin. And the plugin for now, at least, is free. One day I might charge for it, but for now it's free. It's uh, one of the most popular plugins on stock charts. I guess it helps that it's free. Now, the dailies become choppy, but sometimes you need to see the forest for the trees. Now, I don't trade off the weekly, but I do like to use it as a reference. And I do find myself, especially with the TFM 10% system, and like, um, I think it was, I forget who pointed out, Jeff, I think Jeff's here tonight. Might, well, Jeff, will you, did you point out the 5%? line for the tfm 10 percent system yes okay so it was jeff thank you jeff so we'll get into that in just one second but looking at that those weekly charts has got me looking at weeklies more and more and paying more and more attention to them i always take a look at them every now and then but now it's almost a daily thing because of the tfm 10 percent system uh jeff says he has the formula for tos now also okay so we can uh Maybe you could share that with me and I could share it. Uh, we'll share it in Facebook group. We'll do that. Perfect. So taking a look at a weekly, you can see we still have pretty nice Landry light. And, and by the way, you know, here's that weekly again, forest for the trees, nice persistent uptrend and nice kind of orderly pullback. And you wouldn't even know the market's choppy based on this. Now, obviously we do take our, our cues and clues off of the daily chart and we do pay attention to what's happening in the daily because obviously when the daily gets questionable then longer term time frames get questionable too also as a general statement you can't sit around and wait for the weekly to fail although the tfm 10 percent system does give you fairly quick signals even on a weekly chart but it's it, that's the price-based aspect of that and i'll explain that in one second so looking at the weekly chart so far so good, you can see we had 24 weeks of Landry light. Remember, this counts the number of days, not the magnitude. So it's not how far price is away from the moving average. That might have some other merits for reverse of the median type of stuff. But all I care about is how long the market has been above that moving average. So in buckwheat speak, market is okay on a weekly basis. Now, getting to the zones that we've been talking about lately with the tfm 10 percent system it's based on a 50-week closing high and then you take five percent off of that and then you take 10 percent off the 50-week closing high to give you the zones and you just uh, make these area charts when you go into acp and you can see the parameters right here so i went in to put a hundred percent so this line here is 100%. You can see as the market drops, it takes 50 weeks to catch up to the market because it's a 50 week closing high, okay? So it takes a while for it to catch up, but eventually it does begin to catch up, especially when you have a fairly extended bear market like we just had. Now, as Jeff pointed out a few weeks ago, and I've been really digging it, is that once you drop below five percent a lot of times he said the signals aren't very much different although when you go in and look at the last hundred and something years you will see there would be quite a bit of whipsaw but it does give you a really good caution when you drop into that red zone so the red zone is five percent or more away from the 50 week closing high and when you drop more than 10%, that's where bad things tend to happen. Any momentum type of indicator that gives you a downside signal or a negative signal or a negative reading, so to speak, is a sign that something's wrong. And when something's wrong, things tend to get worse. So you have to be careful. 
Now you have to be, you can't, you can't get too antsy and every time things get a little bit iffy, bail out. But when you get, in this case, I think the 5% makes a really good caution zone. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bail out on a market when it gets in that, drops below that 5%. But I would take notice and I would think about possibly getting ready to get out when that happens. So now what's kind of interesting is the 50 week closing high is the high we set back in July around 4,600 round numbers, okay? Or just below it. So, so far, based on the weekly chart, we're still okay with the market. And again, it's look, it looks like we just had a little bit of a pullback down to the to the five percent line and i'm wondering if maybe those type of pullbacks could be played as a, a longer term signal maybe that's something a little uh something that could be fodder for research possibly okay let's skip back to the daily chart let's take a look at the daily bow ties and look at proper order here proper order for bow ties is just 10 simple greater than 20 exponential greater than 30 exponential and down here we have a histogram once again showing us or illustrating to us how long that has been in effect and you can see that we had about 90 days where the market stayed where the moving averages correction where the moving averages stayed in uptrend proper order now when they start to kind of intermingle and cross over and they're not in uptrend proper order or downtrend proper order, that becomes a caution, okay? And then it's bad, of course, when they're in downtrend proper order. Now, keep in mind, there's a little lag to this, but a little lag in trend following is not always a bad thing. A little lag keeps you from chasing your own tail. If you bail out every time things get a little iffy, you're never gonna stick with a trend longer term. But there are signs and signals to let you know that Yes, it is time to bail out. If you get a TFM 10% system, sell signal. If the bow ties on the daily have crossed over, especially if they're coming off a major high, then maybe it's time to think about getting out of the way. And of course, if you're getting weekly signals in addition to TFM 10% system, then it really may be time to get out of the way. But you can see we went from caution to kind of bad, back to caution. And now we've turned back green with moving averages. So that's a good thing. Provided, of course, it, it continues to stay that way. Now, one thing, I think question three is how do we know when things improve? And I'm going to get into that in just a few minutes. But thinking out loud, one extra thing to add to that would be number of days that the moving averages are in uptrend proper order. And, of course, number of days that you have 30 EMA Landry light. So we only have... I guess one day of upside Landry light, but a slightly slower indicator, slower meaning more lag, would be the moving averages. And the moving averages are actually back in uptrend proper order. So let's see how long that can hold. Maybe if we get about 20 bars of that. Okay, let's see how many bars. It's too many to count, but let's see what 20 would be. So back here, somewhere in here, you had about 20 bars of that. And you can see the trend continued on. So maybe if we get 20 bars of that, that might be a good little um, something to watch, okay? But for the most part, when you're seeing that yellow and red and yellow and green and red or whatever, flipping back and forth, it's a choppy market. Now, once again, we get to the weekly, the 10 is greater than 20 and the 20 is greater than 30. And it's been like that for 24 weeks, okay? So that's, that's a good thing, right? Buckwheat says it's okay. Now, whenever a market gets really choppy, this is a, an indicator that I use a lot of. I tend to just draw lines on the charts and eyeball things. And I spend a lot of time working on the net-net price movement, which we'll take a look at in just one second. And net-net meaning, okay, where are the P's now? Round numbers, 4,500. Okay, where were they back in July or late June, 4,500, okay? So that tells me the market hasn't made much forward progress over that period of time. But what's kind of fun to do sometimes, and again, I know you want to party with me, but you could put these linear regression lines in here 
and a linear regression line, like if I move this chart, if, it, if I were able to move this chart to the left, and I'm using the, the newer telecharts, so I don't know if they, they have a linear regression that would follow the price, but I used to be able to put these in and back the chart out. But if I back the chart out to like right to this peak here, this blue line would intersect nearly most of these lines. That's what linear regression is. It's like you take point A and you take point B and you just draw a line between them for the most part, you average them all out. Well, you could just draw a line through as many bars as possible and I call that persistency. So mathematically, persistency is probably equivalent to linear regression if you had to program it. And I recommend you don't, but sometimes when you put an illustrator like this on the chart, and this is, if you could see these parameters, 5, 10, 15, 20, and then I jump to 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and I think this one's 100. To just give you an idea of where the market was and where it is based on a linear regression plot, okay? But you can see the 5 and 10, and, the, and they're all kind of intermixed in here. And I think it's called pickup sticks. I don't know if you guys ever played that as a kid. You had these little colored sticks and you throw them on the ground. And I, I don't know, the, you had to pick up different colors without touching colors. So I'm not forget how it worked. But it reminds me of that because it makes a huge mess of the floor. That's what it looks like. So when you see a lot of these little linear regressions all over the place like this, pick up sticks. Okay, yeah, that's what it's called. So it looks like, yeah, your parents, uh, you know, always... <laughs> I don't have any grandkids, but like my uh, like neighbors and all, like there's a birthday party tomorrow. I'm gonna go get something noisy, messy, or has a lot of parts, and ideally all three. <laughs> a buddy of mine, he he had these two um, you know, like god kids or whatever, and they were uh, he named one Holy Terror and the other one Torture Box. They would like come over to his house and destroy stuff. He had his, his brother was in the liquor business. He had all these liquor bottles, these like Carvet uh, Jim Beam bottle. And the little kids ran around the house and untwisted the, the tax seal on all these uh, vintage <laughs> decanters or whatever you call them, uh, pretty much making them worthless. <laughs> so he, I'm sure knowing him, he probably drank the liquor. Anyway, long story in this, he, he bought them uh, these headsets that had like a little water tank on it. And the louder you would scream, the more water would squirt out. So he got messy and loud all together, all together in, in one thing. I've been trying to figure out if I can make one or I find one. The vintage ones are like just ridiculously expensive. That would be a perfect gift to give. Anyway, boy, I, I digress. Imagine that. So you can see it looks up, looks like the pickup sticks. It's just kind of all over the place. Now, it's interesting if you pop out to the weekly chart, it looks, once again, a heck of a lot cleaner, although it does have a little bit of that mixed performance in here as of late. So... This is something to play with. I'm not sure that this could be a strategy in and of itself. I think it's another interesting illustrator, so to speak, to help you to recognize what's happening in the market. And 99% of the time, I'm just using a blank chart before, or well, always look at a blank chart first. And then 90% of my analysis is done on that. And then I'll throw in some other stuff just to kind of see what's going on. Rarely do I use something like this linear regression unless we get into a market where it, it kind of helps illustrate to what's happening like lately okay any questions on that any thoughts on that john says the bar range on the monthly is kind of interesting we'll take a look at the monthly in a minute good idea okay jeff's going to post the uh code which is cool thank you jeff okay the third part of his question was how can we tell when we are out of the current malaise is it just breaking out above the July highs or is there a possibility to get in early with the pullback? Well, I'm not sure exactly what he means about the pullback and we can, I could talk to him at Facebook and see what he meant about that. But as far as how do we know we're out of the current malaise, new highs, so in answer to his question about above the July high, that would be new highs, obviously. Landry lights, which we just talked about, and the database speaking. Now, I got this email last minute, so I, did, I didn't have a lot, wasn't able to put together, again, a lot on the database speaking. But if you follow the service, and if you're not on the service, follow the delayed service, when you see me start recommending energies, for instance, you'll know that the database is speaking that the energies 
or setting up and might be worthwhile. And if you start seeing some other stocks setting up on the long side, then you know the market's improving in some other areas. And if you see more shorts setting up, then you know that the market is deteriorating and possibly rolling over. Now, getting back to the how do you know, obviously the July highs, as Asim pointed out, would be a pretty good reference. Now, keep in mind that breakouts are prone to failure. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if we broke out above 4,800 and then came right back in and chopped around a little bit. But you know me, one day at one day at a time. Let's see what happens when we get there. Now, so new highs would be important, and then of course the the net net price change would also be very important. So if we take a look at the S&P 500, when I grab this snapshot, we we're at 4505 and you go all the way back to August and where were we 4505. In fact, you could extend this all the way back to July as I did earlier, okay? And you could see that we really haven't made forward progress based on the net net price movement. So that's another thing that you might want to do first and foremost, okay, is draw some horizontal lines from where we are and see how far back you can go and see if the net net price change is pretty much nil. So in this case, the net net is nil all the way back to August. And in fact, again, if you go all the way back, you can go all the way back to July and you can see we had many forward progress. So that's a bit of a bummer. Now also notice that we've chopped around that 30 EMA. And again, you had Landry light above and below. And again, the net net is nil and the market went down, the market went up, the market went down, and now it's going back up a little bit. So it's a Jackie Mason kind of market. So again, pay attention to that Landry light down here. Notice that it can't seem to get a trend going. And and you know, as I'm giving this presentation, it amazes me how simple it is just seeing it. It's like I'm seeing it for the first time here. It's kind of like getting hit in the head with a halibut. Like, well, look at it. It's just, this is good, Tarzan speak, as I've said before, when you got green happening for quite some time. You can see I have my line set to 10, my reference lines. So we had 10 bars of upside Landry light and no guarantee that this will always happen, but you had another 30 weeks where the market moved higher after that. So that's kind of, that's kind of pretty cool. If that doesn't get you excited, then maybe you need to find something else to do, you know? But this nerd stuff is pretty cool. So this is something I've been looking for for most of the day. And when I received the email, I began to look a little harder and I found it. It's something I'm working on. This hasn't been run through a grammar check or anything or read out loud even. And I guess I run a risk of danger doing that now. But basically I was thinking that there's three wins and three wins equals three wins. And trading is hard because it appears easy. When you boil it all down, all you got to do is figure out these three wins. And the reason I say all you got to do, for those who haven't been in these presentations before, back, especially back in the country, but even to this day, my wife will, if she needs something done, a honeydew or something fixed, she's like, well, all you got to do is just, you know, take your little wrench and on that pipe and, you know, as soon as I do, another leak gets sprung or something metastasizes and there goes a whole day and, uh, you know, working on something. But on the surface, yeah, that little leaky faucet looks like it'd be really simple to fix. And before you know it, you're getting valve stems and replumbing stuff and, and it's just a huge mess on your hands. But on the surface, trading is pretty simple. And if you could figure out these three wins, W-H-E-N-S, you would own the world. And those three wins are when to buy when to sell, and when to sit on your hands. So again, you figure out these three wins, you own the world, and it's easier said than done, but it can be done, okay? So there's no holy grail, obviously, but trading in a conceptually correct manner will go a long way of getting you there. In other words, trading with the trend, trading when you have a lot of setups, okay? Let's say we have one mediocre setup, like there's been a few lately, and I showed one in a service lately that was kind of an okay looking setup, but it had a mound of overhead resistance right above it. So why take this mediocre setup when you can wait for something that's much, much better? 
But anyway, trading in a conceptually correct manner will go a long ways to getting you there if the stock and the sector and the indices are all trending based on the net net price move and all these other things we just talked about these trend qualifiers which help to show that it's a healthy trend if it's persisted persistent accelerating and again you've got a plethora of setups and you got plenty of landry light and all these other trend qualifiers then maybe it's a good time to be trading or if the market itself is making a major transition if the individual sectors are making major transitions then maybe those areas might be worth trading the home builders recently rolled over they're looking kind of ugly in here excuse me we're short kbh so that's the only short we have on right now so maybe those guys are going to continue to roll over as i often say when i recommend a short i'd much rather get stopped out of my shorts for a loss and then make a whole bunch of money on a long side than make money on a short side because it's a little harder to make money on a short side and it's like you make a bunch of money when the market cracks and then it becomes like a bit of a now what type of thing. But before I digress too far, you'll know when things are good. It's like, it's just the opposite of now. Me making excuses for doing nothing and telling you to do nothing because I'm not doing anything. That's a time where you shouldn't be trading. And if I get hit by a beer truck, everything you learn tonight, net net price movement, Landry lights, bow tie proper order, and all that other good stuff, just use that to let you know what the market is doing. So if all these things are happening, either fantastic trends, clean trends, tons of setups, or some sort of transitional pattern, let's say the market's bottoming out for a while, begins to rally from lows, makes a bow tie, or just the opposite like the home builders are doing now, then you know that everything's kind of lining up the planets are lining up so to speak stars lining up and you have the wind at your back that's a mixed metaphor i believe but you're at, at the least you're off to a good start now if the markets are lackluster so that's one win that's win to buy okay but the markets are lackluster based on the trend qualifiers then you should be sitting on your hands and again, recognizing when there is no trend is key. And again, the simplest way to do that is look at that net net price change, okay? If we're no higher now than we were two months ago, three months ago, then maybe we're not trending. It's not rocket science. And like I said earlier, yes, you have like a great trend like we had back coming into July, we had a plethora of setups. Those start setting up. Those start stopping out at losses, and new ones stop. Uh, new ones don't trigger. And before you know it, you're in this choppy malaise, which is a great name for it, by the way. Thanks again on that. So that's when you don't want to be trading. Now, as a trend follower, you're going to be a little late to leave the party. Okay. You're also going to be a little late to get to the party, okay? Because in order to follow a trend, there must first, first be a trend for you to follow. So as I've preached ad nauseum, the secret to trading is not losing money during less than ideal conditions. And believe me, I come in every day and try to force things to happen. I'm trying to make money in zero DT options and failing miserably so far did incredibly well for a while but then began to fail miserably i'm just trying to pull some money out of the market and there's just no money to be taken and this just reminds me to just hey do nothing and follow your core methodology which means do nothing right now but then wait because you don't know do your homework while you wait i should say because you don't know when that next big trend is going to come along. And as I've said 10,000 times, and I just gave the example about a gentleman who was thinking about quitting, I don't know whether he did or not, back in May. And had he quit, he would have missed the mother of all trends. And I think he did miss the trends because I asked him, hey, what do you think back in July? And he was like, well, it looks like we're starting to chop around again. So it's like, not to pick on him, but, he's probably never going to make it as a trader because he he sees a beautiful trend and then he's like oh well it's choppy now we're due to trend so i'm just going to stay out of the market and then he sees another trend and then he doesn't get in and the market chops around and you could see how that could be a vicious cycle 
So knowing what to do and when to do it is, is not nearly as hard as you might think, but it is easier said than done. And that's the beauty of the core methodology is I'm forced to put out a plan and I don't wanna look like an idiot and I don't wanna lose my, my own hard earned capital. So that's why a lot of times I'm saying, do nothing, okay? And if you looked at my portfolios right now, my stock portfolios, my position trades, I would have no setups in them that have nothing to do with the core methodology. Everything in my portfolio now is exactly as you see it in the core methodology. Now, that doesn't mean that it won't always look like that because maybe if conditions are really, really great and I see a setup that might be a little bit thin or it might be a little bit uh, bad spread or whatever, but looks like a decent setup, but super risky, that might also be in my portfolio. And that'll probably be shown in the Landry list more than likely. So you know where I'm coming from and what stocks I'm picking. But the thing is, I always come back to, and I know because I, and this is why I come back to this. I know I'll lose clients if I don't recommend anything. I know I won't lose as many clients if I recommend stinkers, okay, and they lose money. For some reason, people just want the action. People would rather lose money with shitty setups than, than sit in their hands and not do anything. So that, and I learned that early on, like I said, back in the trading markets days, when they had salesmen, I kind of got in the whole education business by accident. That's a whole nother story, two drink minimum on that. But the bottom line is the salespeople would beg me to recommend setups. And I'm like, no, I'm not gonna do it until I find setups that are worth recommending. Anyway, so that's the secret to trading. One of the secrets of trading, I should say, is not losing money doing less than ideal conditions. If you can avoid poor conditions, then all that's left is good conditions, right? And it's it's easier said than done than done. And it seems like forever. And a lot of people think, well, I'm gonna quit doing my homework, or I, you know, not that I'm the grand pumba, but I'm just saying for any methodology in general. But they're like, well, I'm gonna quit your service because I don't see any setups anytime on the horizon. And guess what? Neither do I. But I come in here every day and do my homework. And there's been countless times, well, 37, where <laughs> maybe 50, where people quit right before everything takes off. Now, obviously, there's no guarantees in life, but I can guarantee if you're following a trend-following type of methodology, like the core methodology, after it doesn't do anything for a while and after the market chops around for, the, for a while, those are some of your best times when the market takes off again. But when you're in the middle of it, it sucks, and it feels like you're never going to get out of it. So much easier said than done waiting for setups. Okay, let's shift gears and talk about crypto. I wanna show you that I actually began to dust off my core methodology and I'm trading a little crypto once again. So here's one setup. You can see this was in a pretty nice trend and it pulled back, not quite to the 30, but this was a super deep pullback and this is a super volatile pair unify it's the first time i said it out loud as you can see you know what these guys do i have no idea i have no idea what this thing is it might be a total shit coin who knows but my ipt is up there okay and should they get hit my stop will go to break even on that one now this one was a landry light pullback you can see it accelerated higher and it had a nice pullback touched that 30 ema and I got in here, I gave it a little wiggle room, obviously on that entry, and my IPT was up here. It did hit the IPT, so I unloaded half. And now I don't have, a, I don't think I have a hard stop in place. I hope I do, I should. But now I need to stop out, I need to at least set an alert. I'll, I'll stop out at 364 for scratch. I don't wanna stop out, so let's let's hope it keeps going, but if it doesn't, then I'll stop out and make a little bit on the trade. Not enough to get rich, but at least I made something on the trade. And it's good to see a couple of pairs waking up. So let's go ahead and shift gears on Forex. And while we're doing that, Jeff says, I have a days above and days below label on my TOS Landry Light study. Perfect. That's perfect. That's cool. All right, thank you. So I'll make sure that gets shared tomorrow.
or you can make sure they get shared tomorrow. And I appreciate that, Jeff. Okay, let's take a look at crypto. So here's the prime that I'm long. We just talked about this. IPT was here. Stop is here. And here's the uh, Unify. Uh, un is it Unify? Unify. And you can see uh, eh, probably slightly, slightly in the black, but nothing to brag about. All right, perfect. Jeff already put it up on Facebook. Thank you, Jeff. BTC, Bitcoin. You can see Bitcoin has pushed it to its 30. And I hate to use the word hold, but hopefully it won't get thwarted again there. We had a little excitement back here about a possible ETF. And the good news is I saw a tweet where it was some government official, I forget who, but he was uh, against a, what do you call it, a CBCD or a, CBD, a, a central bank digital currency, whatever they call them. It's probably not going to be good if governments start creating digital currencies. Uh, I do like Bitcoin. I do like Ethereum. Okay, the big boys. I like those guys. These shit coins are a lot of fun to trade, and uh, Bitcoin can be fun to trade at times. But I see them as pure trading instruments. I don't try to build a case for them, although I do kind of feel like Bitcoin longer term could actually work. And the thing about Bitcoin is it's caught on to a fact to, enough to where you got BlackRock looking at it. You've got uh, Greystone trying to get the ETF. Greystone's been uh, the the kind of the ETF sort of um, for GBTC, for Bitcoin for quite some time. It's in, It used to be at a huge discount, probably still is. So should that ETF get approved, that, that should come a little closer to the uh, actual price should uh, rally up 20 what is it 20 or 40 percent or whatever it is but anyway you can see bitcoin not a whole lot to get excited about and the reason I, i'm kind of halfway making a case for this and maybe i listen to too much michael Saylor, but one thing i believe is there's just not enough to go around and when i did an article on bitcoin a few years ago and it, it's on my website i'll maybe i could um refresh it so it it bubbles up to the surface again. It's buried in the back end now. But I was kind of fascinated that at 21 million, that's enough for everybody in Florida to have one or for everyone in California, every other person in California to have one. And that's that's the supply. And like I said, BlackRock's interested and you got Greystone and you've got all these big institutions. And then the layman, the guy on the street is kind of interested in it too. And I think the ETF, uh, not to confuse the issue with facts, but the ETF would put the layman into it and that might or should create a huge boost if uh, the you know man on the street begins to accumulate some Bitcoin because a lot of people have no idea how to purchase Bitcoin. But if you could just buy a stock, that's Bitcoin. Hey, buy me some Bitcoin stock, you can do that. I think the reason Bitcoin isn't a hundred thousand or a million dollars each right now, and this is kind of the, the 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 bummer part, is there's too much paper Bitcoin out there. And as there's more and more derivatives, I know it sounds like I'm talking a little bit out of both sides of my mouth, but you got Bitcoin futures now, and then uh they're looking into all these spot ETFs and, and all these derivatives and stuff. So I think that kind of dilutes it all. It's kind of like the gold analogy. And I think one of you guys said we were, we were trying to figure out how much gold there is in the world. And it's a little, it's a lot more than I thought, but it's not that much. All the gold in the world would fit into an Olympic sized swimming pool. Okay. So some of you guys, I used to live on six acres, I had a big enough backyard then. I probably no longer have a big enough backyard, but most of you guys, or some of you guys, I should say, all the gold in the world would fit in your backyard. I guess if you stacked it up, it certainly would. But it seems like there's there should be a lot more demand for gold with so little gold supply. And I think that's because there's so many derivatives out there. And I think people have pointed out in the past, uh, especially with like crude oil and all, there's, there's more like contracts on crude oil than there is actual crude oil. So that's kind of a, an interesting thing. I know I kind of digress. Um, any any crypto pairs you guys want to look at before we hop into the stock market? As I've said before many times, when you get into a rip-roaring 
bull market in these guys, sometimes you could just sort by the strongest and then jump on. Now is not one of those times, but it's cool that a couple of them have begun to improve and we could see some possible setups and some more and more of these in the future. It's a bit of a bummer because uh, KuCoin has a KYC that it, it won't let you do your KYC, know your customer for the states. I guess the government doesn't want KuCoin in the states and KuCoin had every shit coin in the world and I bought and sold so much crap there, I had no idea what it was, but it was absolutely amazing. So let's just real quick, let's, uh, let me just see that if that post is there. So this is my Facebook group, Dave Landry's Trend Traders. You do have to be a gold member at least, or a service member of my website. Okay, cool, right there. So uh, Jeff posted, there's your, your code for Landry Light for Think or Swim. So thank you, Jeff, and for everybody else, you're welcome. <laughs> or, or thank Jeff, I should say. All right, let's shift gears and let's take a look at the market and let's uh, drill down a little bit. Okay, let's get the bow ties in here. And we'll take a look at the P's. If you guys want to ask about individual issues, feel free to do so now. I know we talk stocks all day on Facebook, and there's, I would be shocked if you have any setups tonight. But I'd, I'd be willing to take a look at anything you might want you might want me to look at. All right, the P's. P's had a good day, up nearly one percent. They've been choppy AF, as you know. I posted in Facebook a few days ago. The spiders have had a four point range or have been contained in the four point range for for a couple of weeks which is pretty amazing or at least a week or two but you can see we're trying to rally a little bit we're back above the 50 simple nothing magical about that bow ties or in proper uptrend proper order and we have one bar of landry light above the 30. now who was it earlier somebody mentioned earlier i think it was jeff maybe talked about the monthly chart so i haven't looked at a monthly in a while but yeah, the monthly, that really helps you see the forest for the trees, right? Look at this big old deep, huge pullback to the 50 month moving average. And then we took off from there. Uh, way too much lag for a monthly chart, obviously, but that's kind of interesting. Uh, thanks for pointing out the monthly, so that's kind of cool. While we're down here in the list, the dollar has been pretty damn amazing as of late. I guess you want to Pick the dog with the leash fleas or the dollars is the dog. That's from uh, Wall Street, the movie. But this is uh, the dog with the leash fleas. That's where I got that from. But you can see we're making these multi-month highs. Highest level in 2023. You got to go all the way back to 2022 to see the dollar any higher. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Now, that could put a little pressure. Let me just jump to energies real quick. That could put a little pressure on the energies because energies or dollar denominated. So if the dollar begins to drop, it's gonna take more dollars to buy energies, buy crude, okay? So that's kind of an interesting thing to look at. We could have those two things in a bit of a tug of war, but it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to see that energy is in an uptrend. Boats high proper order, tons and tons and tons of land you like, the 50 simple, you have Landry Light above that, and you have a nice uptrend. So John was talking about the monthly. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ Composite peeping up above the 50, simple, still touching that 30, so no Landry Light there. All these indices have a bit of a head and shoulder top to them. I don't trade, as I preach, directly off of a big picture classical technical analysis pattern like that, but I do pay attention to it. And sometimes you get a bow tie on the right side, obviously, of a head and shoulder or a first thrust or some other sort of transitional pattern. So you do need to pay attention to those. Just real quick, there's a euro. You can see euro is kind of melting down in here. Had a really ugly day today. So that's kind of cool. Let's take a look at, I know, such a nerd, huh? Let's take a look at the rusty. Same as it ever was. Huh? A little bit of a bounce today, but just, just 
stuck in this sideways range. I'm going to use that malaise word again because that looks like a malaise to me. A lot of areas looking kind of ugly in here. Foods bounce a little bit, but they look poised to continue lower. Financials have been kind of toppy in here, as you can see, as of late. And if you didn't know anything about markets, again, just take a look at the net net price movement. I think. I was thinking the monthly illustrated the volatility changes from the uptrend to the downtrend. Okay, let's take a look at that. SP 500. And that's the other thing I was looking at earlier, but I couldn't deduce anything. I was plotting multiple volatilities using HV with the S&P 500 doing the research for tonight. And I was wondering if like the volatility had come off because of the choppiness, the ups and downs were kind of negating uh, it themselves in a narrow ranges, but I really didn't gleam have, there really wasn't a whole lot to glean from that type of analysis. Sometimes, like I said before, I talked about a day trader once, couldn't figure out why he was losing money. And we looked at one of his favorite stocks, I think it was Boeing, and we looked at the volatility and the volatility was nuts back in the pandemic, but then that volatility came off hard. And so he no longer had the range to trade off of. So I was hoping that we'd figure something out with the HV, with the P's, but um, nothing. there's really nothing to glean from that. By the way, let's pull the VIX up real quick and then we'll go back to that um, monthly chart. VIX is getting pretty stretched in here. Let's take a look at the VIX research. If I could find it, there it is. So, eh, not too, too stretched. We're down, we're, we're closing in on 10%. We get 10% or more away from that 10 day simple. That's when you gotta be cautious and pay attention for a possible correction or a possible rollover at least shorter term. So we'll we'll see what happens there, but we are getting a little stretched, so we need to pay attention to that. In case they get a hit by a beer truck, start watching that. Defense stocks have broken down in earnest, okay? They're bouncing a little bit, but now they have the mother of all overhead supply above them, okay? Manufacturing is an area that's kind of all over the place. It, it did try to take off, but then it came back in. So that looks a little questionable mnc as i've been saying looks kind of ugly in here that's materials and construction a little bit of a bounce today i'm kind of bearish on these guys they're in it's still a bit of a pioneer type of setup that they're in the early phase of rolling over one or two big up days would negate all of this and that's the scary part about being short we are short kvh and so far not so good we're underwater on that we're short from 49 and we're a little bit above that I think the first day we were in it, we made it, we were up, but then that was it since. But that's shorts. Shorts are pain in the butt talks, as you probably know. Transport's looking questionable. A little support down here, but looking pretty ugly. Mostly a downtrend. Software is kind of a bummer because it was crawling back to its old highs, and then it imploded a bit, and now it's trying to crawl back up there. So at the least, kind of sideways on a net-net basis. It had been improving again, but beginning to worsen once again. Semiconductors still look toppy in here in longer term they they got forwarded at their old high so that's a bit of a concern and we just got to chop it around so i don't want to rush out and buy any samies and the other thing too as far as like the database let me just show you one example i could think of uh is it a asmr or a amsr what's the what's the semiconductor well i, I can't remember it a s m r but anyway, it was it was an okay looking pullback. ACMR, AC, ACMR. Yeah, it was an okay pullback, but then it just it's wide and loose and kind of all over the place and has a lot of, of overhead supply to deal with longer term. This looks pretty good, okay. It, in fact, I, I meant I meant to post this in Facebook, like, hey, you guys like this setup? And there was another one too, like an Energies VT. BTLE, I think, you know, this is okay. Don't get me wrong, but I'd prefer to find something without a whole lot of overhead supply. Thank you, uh, Jeff, on that one. Let's take a look at, uh, what is it, BTLE. So this is another one, okay? This, uh, today notwithstanding, but it was kind of setting up as a pullback in here. But you back the chart out, it's got a mountain of overhead supply. So that looks pretty ugly longer term. So this is a lot of what I'm seeing out there. And this is why as clients, you're not seeing any setups from me. Okay, let's shift gears and take a, oh, we'll take a look at the monthly real quick. And you were saying about the shifts in volatility.
Well, you can certainly see the 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 spike bear markets in here, but that doesn't mean you should ride them out, you know. So I wouldn't. I'd be careful using the monthly, but then every now and then plot it just to kind of see where we are and kind of the 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 big huge picture picture cycle. But I would caution you into being careful there because I mean you look at like that move there as well, like forty percent lower during the pandemic, thirty something percent at least. Okay, uh, GCT. Okay, GCT. This is kind of a crazy one. HV is 102. And it's kind of off to the races back in here, came all the way back in. It began to take off. It's pulled all the way back in from where it tried to take off. I think it looks okay, but I think it's just a little, this uh, spike top in here just kind of looks like a bottle rocket type of thing it's imploded all the way back down i think it's too dangerous to go after I, I think it's still in an uptrend for now and i think there that if it did begin to take off it could go back to the old highs i just don't think it's worth the risk uh john on that one okay anything else you guys want to look at and believe me there's just i don't see much out there maybe maybe you guys could could uh if there's something you could find, let me know or, or leave a comment below and I'll, I'll take a look at it and let you know what I think. All right, going once, going twice. Well, obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for tuning in tonight. If you're watching this on YouTube, thank you too. If you like it, like the video. If you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. I'm half kidding. <laughs> but uh, if you do like what you're seeing, please subscribe and please like and all the other good stuff. To everyone here, I'll see you tomorrow on Facebook. To everyone else, have a great weekend, and hopefully I'll see you again next Thursday. Thank you so much, and may the trend be with you.